At Corwin, we believe in the power of education to transform lives, both for our students and for ourselves as professionals. And so we honor your time with us to here today. And you can see our mission and vision here on the screen. We hope that you can find some common ground with our beliefs about education professional learning with us today. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's topic and presenters. Uh, during today's presentation on making sense of learning transfer, uh, Julie Stern and Natalie Lorio will discuss how educators can promote depth and breadth of understanding by using learning transfer as both a means and an end goal of learning. Julie Stern is an author, consultant, trainer, and instructional coach who supports schools in transforming teaching and learning based on how students learn best. She's the author of Tools for Teaching Conceptual Understanding, Elementary and Secondary, published by Corwin. And she's also a certified visible learning consultant and the developer of a new suite of uh, P PD services focused on classroom instruction that promotes deep and transfer levels of learning uh, called Making Sense of Learning Transfer. Uh, this is available exclusively through Corwin. Natalie Lorio is an elementary teacher in Ontario, Canada with 30 years of experience. She specializes in teaching young children in mostly bilingual classroom settings. She's the co-author of Teaching for Tools for Teaching and Conceptual Understanding Elementary with Julie Stern, and she is a certified consultant for Making Sense of Learning Transfer. As a reminder, we'll be sharing a link to the recording for this webinar and the downloadable slides along with your PD certificate via email after the webinar. Without further ado, I will turn the webinar over to our presenters today, Julie Stern and Natalie Lorio. Thanks, Charlene. Thank you, Jeff. Hello to everybody. Thank you for joining us. We're going to get right in and start off with a poll question. So if you haven't attended a webinar before, maybe this will be new to you. For those of you who, who have attended, hopefully this won't be new. Um, but I simply want to know, why did you sign up for today's webinar? So a poll question should pop up on your screen. Is it the topic of learning transfer is one of your passions? Are you familiar with it? Um, is the topic just sort of piqued your interest and you want to know more? Was the topic or the webinar promoted by someone you trust? So you said, hey, I'll, I'll join. Were you encouraged to attend by your supervisor or is there some other reason? So you can go ahead and select your entry from the pop-up screen that came up. And for those of you who completed early, if you want to open the chat box and just sort of let us know who you are, um, where you're coming from, why you joined the webinar, that would be awesome. So we can just sort of see who's here and, and then we'll see sort of the results. All right, so we have Pennsylvania, we have Alberta, Canada. Let's see, the topic piqued my interest and I want to know more is our number one response. We have several people who are already interested in learning transfer. Very cool. Um, only a couple encouraged to attend by my supervisor. I always get a couple who, uh, who sort of say they were forced to come. Um, let's see. All right, we have somebody from Singapore. Very cool. And so the next slide is really just a self-reflection. This is not a poll question. I really just want you to sort of set an intention for the webinar because I know it's, it's kind of, they can be kind of passive. And so how engaged will you be in today's webinar? So from a scale from one to 10, one being multitasking, half listening, which I I've, I've do that with webinars all the time. Um, 10 would be all in ready to make a, a usable plan. And so for those of you who are anywhere between seven and 10, I'd like to recommend that you select a specific topic or a learning objective that you want to use as an example today. We're going to get straight into um, some practical strategies that you can use immediately, whether or not you're a teacher or a supervisor. You might want to pick like some, uh, any sort of teaching topic that you want to pick to use as a, as a strategy today. And so I'd also like to begin with somewhat of an analogy to try and address some misunderstandings um, based on my previous work. So this is an analogy based on a, a Buddhist teaching. I want you to imagine that you've picked up a coin and that coin represents what you already do really well. And if you hold it tightly with your palm facing the ground, what? if you let go or relax it, what will happen? The coin, or in this case, the strategies that you already do really well in your classroom will fall. But there's another possibility. You can keep what you already do best and add what we are saying to your practice. Simply 
turn your hand over so it faces the sky. And you can open it to collect what we are saying, and you can keep what you already do best. So in some ways, what we're saying can become a bit of a base so that students can hold more factual information. So I'm sort of shifting the analogy a little bit to say what Natalie and I are going to present to you today in some ways the, is, is somewhat the symbol of the hand so that students can hold more factual information and refine it and deepen their understanding. So let's get right into the agenda. The first thing we're going to talk about is this question. How can we help students use what they've learned to solve complex problems? What are some ideas, some key ideas that I can apply immediately in the classroom? And what do we need to consider for long-term planning that facilitates transfer? And so I want to let you know that we've got some math, we've got language arts, we've got social studies, we've got science, we have early years, middle school, high school, but I really want you to try and take what Natalie and I are saying today and figure out how you can apply it in your particular context, because there's no way we can talk about in 45 minutes, every single discipline, every single grade level, every single place in the world where you are teaching. So I'd like to sort of frame it by starting off with what's most, something that might be passionate for you. So another poll question is gonna pop up. And what issue in the world right now is, are you most passionate about? What is most important to you? And so we have option A would be healthcare disease. Option B, we economy or jobs. C is climate change or the environment. D is social justice or equity. And E is other. So a, a screen should have popped up. If not, maybe you can just type your response in the, in the chat. So I see some people say they're having trouble getting the um, box to pop up, which is fine. I see it, so most people should see it. And you can type your response into the chat if you'd like. So if some people are typing C, climate change. Some people are typing E, other. If it's other, then go ahead and share with us what's the other issue that's most important to you. I'll just give a few seconds and then we'll post. Oh, here we go. Thanks, Jeff. So social justice or equity is the number one response with climate change coming in as second. A um, few people saying economy or jobs, healthcare, disease, and then a few other. And so I'm seeing in the, in the chat some education in general, um, education for all, especially equity. And so I, why, are, why are we starting here? So I want us to think about why learning a transfer is essential. And why are we talking about learning transfer? And so whether or not we you know, picked climate change as, as one of the major issues, we can all see plainly observe the issue of plastic waste in, in our oceans and our waterways. And so just a few stats on that, there are over 100 million tons of plastic drifting in the oceans. And every year, more than 100,000 turtle, marine mammals, or seabirds die from plastic consumption. And so we definitely have an issue with plastic waste in, around the world. Another issue we talked about was health. Some people selected health. In my home state of Louisiana, there's an area known as Cancer Alley, and it's known as Cancer Alley. It's due to the exponential increase in cancer for the residents that live in this area. And so that's a major issue that, of concern for me and my family. And then of course there's migration. It's another touchy subject across the world, and it's not just affecting the United States or maybe where you guys are from, but migration, people are already starting to migrate due to pollution and climate change. And we've seen nearly double the number of migrants since 2000, and the number continues to rise every single year. And how does that affect educators is that educators keep seeing an increasing number of English language learners coming into their classroom. There's one school division that I work with in Alberta, in rural Alberta, and teachers are reporting somewhere around 60% of students are non-native English speakers. And the beautiful thing that I find about teachers is that we're there for the kids, and kids are kids no matter who they are, no matter what language they speak. And so this is something that um, is facing all of us. And so I like to start with that because all of this leads to my passion personally, is how do we promote students' abilities to use what they've learned to solve complex problems. And that's really what today's webinar is, is trying to achieve, is helping us organize teaching and learning in such a way that students are able to answer this question. That's what learning transfer is, using what they've learned in the classroom to solve complex problems in the world. And going back to our, our initial issues, as a social scientist, all of these issues are interrelated and all of these issues are interconnected. 
And the first step for us is to start to see the relationships and the connections between ideas. And so I want you all to imagine, even though I'm starting with these really heavy topics, seemingly very, very difficult to solve, but I want you to imagine that a school has already aligned concepts throughout the years, building sophistication and student understanding and intentionally transferring these ideas from local to global context. Imagine a school where students are studying ecosystems, interdependence, health, economics, migration, and equity. Year after year, they're transferring their understanding and increasing the sophistication of these ideas. And imagine that they're exploring the relationships between these ideas through several different case studies. So for those of you who might have a copy of my book in front of you, our books, we're gonna put some page numbers. These, we just use the question stems on page 29 and 25. What's the relationship between climate change and equity? Imagine if a ninth grader explored that through several different case studies. How does climate change impact health? Imagine if then in 10th grade, they were exploring this relationship. Then in 11th grade, what effect do climate change and jobs have on migration? And then in 12th grade, how do economics and climate change interact? Because none of this is easy. All of this is really complex. And it's something that we can't just focus on one project at a time. We have to integrate our, our studies year after year so that kids are really able to attack this. So let's start with what is a concept. All of these things in red are what we call concepts. And so here's, I like to use James Nottingham's definition from the learning challenge. He says a concept is an organizing idea containing attributes derived from examples. And so it's simply something that we use to organize our world. With students, I say exactly that. Concepts are words that we use to organize and categorize our world. And so for young children, pattern is a concept. Whole number is a concept. Fraction is a concept. Oral communication character and word choice. So all standards have this in their, in their, stand, in their guides, all learning outcomes, all standards um, across the world. I've seen something like this. So we use these words, but people often think that concepts have to be this grand abstraction such as change or form. But many words we use in school all the time are concepts. The key point is that we have to be intentional with what we do with them. That's the larger point. What are we doing with these concepts? And so I wanna open this up for you guys. I like to use this visual. It's from Fisher Fry and Hattie's Visible Learning for Literacy. What is your current thinking about each level? So if you wanna go there and, and go into the chat, you can type in, what does surface level learning mean to you? All right, so I'm seeing some things in chat, and some of you are saying that it's basic ideas, the beginning of learning, memorization. And so I would say that a big aha moment for me was that I thought about surface level learning all wrong. In fact, if it's not a corresponding concept, then it's not actually surface, it's rote. And so some of you are writing sort of memorization or facts or basic skills, I would say we need to rethink the way that we think about surface level learning. So John Almerod said this, he's a professor at James Madison University and also a Corwin author. Too often we get surface level learning all wrong. Without a corresponding concept, it is rote learning. That was a huge aha moment for me in my career, hearing him say that and thinking more about that. And so it's also the connections between concepts that makes deeper learning happen. So the initial exposure to concepts is surface level and the connections between concepts is the deeper learning, then we can transfer it. And so this is what I wanna sort of use as a visual, we'll come back to it throughout. So here's a, a video, a quick video of my son. He came home from preschool and he told, was so excited because he had done a science experiment and I hadn't heard him use that word before, so I was really excited. So this is just a quick video. We're actually waiting in the doctor's office, so the quality is not great, but I just said to him, tell me about your experiment and what did you learn from your experiment? And so I think this illustrates a really important point about surface level learning versus rote. So I want you guys just to take a, take a listen and see what you think. In science, 
in water, red food coloring, and flour. Yeah, into your experiment. What did you learn from your experiment? That, that red and white makes pink. <laughs> what else did you learn from your experiment? Nothing else. I just think that is so telling the nothing else. He was so excited. And I have been, you know, raise your hands if you've been guilty of thinking so hard about how to make learning engaging to where we kind of forget about the learning. We work so hard on making it hands-on and super fun and super interactive that we maybe lose sight of what it is we're trying to get the students to learn. And so I thought, um, that was a really good example of that. So all kindergarten, this is from the Texas. Texas is a big, um, a lot of people logged on are from Texas. So I used the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, but this is also in the Next Generation Science Standards. So it's kindergarten science. It's about scientific investigation, asking questions, communicating observations. And there's also um, standards about properties of matter and the concepts, which is a concept, and solid, liquid, and gas for this age level are all concepts. And so I wonder if the teacher would have asked, what happens when we mix a solid and two liquids? He's, young, he's old enough to understand that the flour is a solid and the other two ingredients were liquids. And what happens whenever we do that and to sort of form a hypothesis? It could have brought learning to the next level. And so here's um, a little chart that I made to kind of contrast rote learning and surface level learning. And so here's an example. Surface is foundational. It's good. We want to do surface level well. So I'll give you a second to read the rote and then the surface. What do you notice? So memorizing math facts or algorithms with no understanding about why, when, and how to use them versus looking for and describing patterns and place value. Here's another one. Here's a social studies one. Memorizing sections of the US Constitution without understanding the purpose of power. Discussing and confirming critical attributes of executive power, judicial power, and legislative power. So where are the concepts? On the right-hand side, pattern and place value are concepts. Again, on this side, executive power, legislative power, and judicial power are concepts. And then finally, identifying literary techniques such as rhyme or repetition, without understanding their purpose in literature or effect on the reader. Versus the teacher using an anchor text to model a think aloud on how authors use persuasive language to manipulate an audience. And so in all of these, I hope you are noticing that the rote has no understanding and the surface is introducing a new concept. I see somebody, Rita, thank you for that, being introduced to a concept is exactly what we're looking for for surface level learning. And so here's a great oversimplification of how to get started. I just, I wanna give you guys some concrete tools to play with in the classroom. This is not the end all be all of unit planning. Um, I want you guys to, unless you're in a coffee shop or, or somewhere where there's a, you're in a public place, I want you to say out loud, this is an oversimplification. But I just wanna give you guys some basic steps. So what you can do immediately is identify the concepts that are in your learning outcomes or your standards or whatever it is that you need to teach. Then you have to plan ways to foster meaning making of the individual concepts. That's basically surface level learning done well. And so that's, there are strategies in my book to be able to do that. Then you write conceptual relationship questions, questions about the relationship between concepts. Then you think of one context that will illuminate the answer and plan for students to articulate the relationship in their own words using evidence from the context. Then we've got deeper learning. And then finally, we can think of at least two additional contexts or learning experiences that further illuminate the answer to the questions, which is learning transfer. So if you want, you can just take a second. I'll give you a couple seconds to look over this and sort of maybe take a picture if you want to use it, but you will get this recording emailed to you as well.
Okay, so here's another example. Lots of teachers want me to show them some learning outcomes or some standards. So again, from the, the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, also this exact same thing is in, the exact same idea is in the kindergarten um, science standards for next generation science standards. So I wanna circle this word interdependence. Interdependence is a foundational concept that if we don't spend time doing lots of meaning making, then a lot of other ideas will not stick. And so this is a, a concept that we wanna make sure we do a decent amount of interdependent, of, of meaning making around the concept of interdependence. And so, Here's one of my favorite strategies. This is from the Foundation for Critical Thinking, interdependence. So we're gonna state the idea clearly, we're gonna elaborate, we're gonna exemplify, and then we'll illustrate it with a metaphor or image. And so I wanna give you guys concrete strategies. This is a magical strategy that I've used in every grade level. For young kids, you just, and Natalie's gonna jump in and give us some more examples for young kids, but you just get them to say it instead of writing it. For older kids, then they need to write out their answers. But the illustrate with a metaphor or an image is non-linguistic representation that you'll see in Marzano's six-step vocabulary model. You'll see in a lot of different research-based strategies to really help solidify because when the brain has to illustrate non-linguistically, it has to think about the critical attributes of a concept in order to to um, identify what they are. And so this is an example of a little boy in a school at the British School Manila. He said, most kids, they'll just take what we are talking about. So we were talking about trees producing oxygen and people um, breathing in the oxygen and also people breathing out carbon dioxide, which the trees use for energy. So we, most kids made out of Play-Doh, their illustrate was a tree and a person. But this, you can push students in this way. This one student, I said to him, can you think of something that's not what we just talked about? And so he said, okay, this is a snowman and a little boy because the snowman is dependent upon the little boy to make him, but the little boy is dependent upon the snowman to make him happy. And I thought that was so great. It was such a great representation of interdependence. It was really cute as well. Um, to show us his, that he understood the idea of interdependence, that they both were dependent upon each other for something. And so here's my first key point. Students must show or tell their understanding of concepts so that we all know where they are in the learning journey. It's essentially making thinking visible and they consolidate and solidify their understanding and better organize their world. So by getting them to show or tell us so someone always popped up, uh, can you repeat what you said about non-linguistically? Getting them to show us through Play-Doh, through drawing, or tell us through writing or orally telling us, really consolidates and solidifies their understanding so that they can better organize their world. And so I wanna give you guys a couple of examples of students using concepts and connecting it to their world. So I did a, an example of a habitat. And we talked about the, the critical attributes of a habitat is that it's a unique environment that provides a home for plants and animals. And those plants and animals are dependent upon that unique environment. And so a little boy came up to me and he said, um, in my, the, back, the pool in my backyard is, is broken. And so the water went out, but a bunch of rainwater came in and it sort of turned all brown, but like tadpoles came. And there's tadpoles living in my broken pool in my backyard. And so I said to the class, okay, class, is this, is this a habitat? Let's, let's use it as our check. Let's look our, at our critical attributes. Does it, is it a unique environment? And they said, yes. Does it support animal life? And they said, yes. And I said, if we took the water out, would those tadpoles still be alive? And they said, no. So I said, it's, those animals are dependent upon the unique environment. So we all agreed that the broken pool in his backyard was indeed a habitat. There's also an English and social studies, this English teacher that I work with um, named Trevor, Trevor Alio, he told me he does a lot of collaboration with um, a social studies teacher in his building. So this is a ninth grade English and social studies class. He told me a student stayed up until 1 a.m. texting her friend about the similarities between Lord of the Flies and the French Revolution. 
And I just thought, yes, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for students to make those connections. That's why we're doing this. And so here's an actionable idea. Select concepts you are currently teaching and ask students to show or tell what they mean. So I'll give you guys just a second to think about what are you currently teaching and ask your students to show or tell what they, they understand them to mean. And I'm going to share this quick video of my son again. He was learning about patterns and he had never had a candy cane. So we're on the road. So it's a, the, the audio quality is not great, but he says, is a candy cane a pattern? And so I'll just sort of play the video for you guys so you can see. Is it a pattern because it repeats red, white, red, white, red, white, is it? Yes, my love. Okay, so that's just a quick example for our early years of how when we teach kids concepts and we do really um, deep meaning making of the concepts, then they're able to make those connections to their, to their world. And so here's another example from my son. From his class, he brought home this worksheet. And so often we say, oh, worksheets are bad. We need more hands-on. And I would say in general, that's an okay thing to, to say. Of course, it's better to have for early years to have lots of materials in the classroom, manipulative, manipulatives that they can play with and sort of figure out um, their learning together. And so this was an example of a worksheet that he brought home and I had never talked to him about some of these words. So I was just interested in whether or not he knew what, um, what symbol meant, what quantity meant. And so I'm gonna ask him, you know, if he can show me the, num the word nine written out as a word can he show me the quantity of nine? And can he show me the symbol for the number nine? Um, and so I'll just show you guys this video, but it sort of blew me away. And so this po the point of this video is to show that kids surprise us, really asking them to show and tell their understanding. Sometimes we think they can't do it. This is, this is a four-year-old telling us his understanding of quantity. So let me show you the video for you guys. Which one shows the word nine written out. Muy bien. And which one shows the quantity of nine? Which one? How do you know? What does quantity mean? Quantity means that there's how many of same things that you want, but there are different kinds of the same thing. Oh. And which one shows the symbol for the number nine? So that's just a quick example of things we could do to ask kids there to show and tell their understanding of different concepts. And so having a kid at this age say quantity means how many of the same things that you want, but they're different kinds of the same things. I have to laugh that he says of what you want, because to him is he's really thinking about how many pieces of candy he can get or how many toys. Um, but that is a really profound understanding of the work of the concept of quantity. And so even very young kids can, sh can tell us, what they understand about different concepts. So I'm gonna let Natalie jump in and talk to us about a way that she's introduced um, concepts to her young children, her young students. Hello, hello everyone. Um, I'm glad I'm part of this uh, webinar and um, um, I hope you're all enjoying it. So I, I am actually a grade two French immersion teacher in Ontario at this point. Um, and I like to play around with, with, with concepts with my students and just explain. So as Julie earlier pointed out, it is important for students to show and tell the understanding of concepts. So every month, my students change place. I have five groups in my classroom and they come in and every month they change place and they find a new group. And I always like to play around with concepts for them just to see where they are. So that particular month, I think it was last month, I brought in my bike and I told the kids that the, my bike was called a system, a system. And I explained to them why it was called a system. I showed them if I move the pedal, every part of the bike moves. 
And I showed them too that if I take something away, for, I did physically take the front wheel off. And I said that the system doesn't work. So then I asked them, I said, no, can I go back to your group and come up with an example for, uh, of a concept of a system in your everyday life? And I said, but you'll need to give me evidence of why it's called a system, why you've picked that example. So it was really interesting. These are seven, eight years old, and they came up with five different names. One was the solar system. The other, one, the other group came up with the human system. Another group came up with the school system, how the school works. And if something doesn't work, then the whole school doesn't function. Another group came up with the road systems with, within the community. And finally, the last group, a car. So it's interesting that even though system was not part of my unit of study, um, I would like to play around with them just to see where they are and what they understand. So if we move on to the other slide, Julie? Okay, so we often need to expand our definitions of concepts. They're simply organizing ideas. And as students grow, the fundamental and powerful concepts that organize their world will start to change. So for example, the young children, they will see plants and animals as a concept. But as they get older, as they move on, they will, it will become living things and non-living things. And then as they increase their sophistication and specificity, they will get, as they get older, they'll have organisms. And finally, the, the last one, which is biotic and abiotic factors. So don't fret over whether or not it's a concept. Just ask yourself, is this a nature-appropriate organizing idea? If so, be sure students make meaning of it by ident identifying the critical attributes of that organizing idea while looking at key examples. Awesome, thank you, Natalie. Pleasure. So the next step is how do we move efficiently through each of these levels? So we talked a bit about surface level learning and how to make meaning. And then how do we, in this introduction to concepts, and then how do we move into deep learning and transfer of learning? And so these are the definitions of these um, different levels by Hattie Fisher and Fry themselves. So Hattie Fisher and Fry say, students explore new concepts and build initial understanding. That's surface level learning done well. And then John Hattie said in Chicago at the annual Visible Learning Conference, when we talk about deep learning, it's about the relationship between ideas. And then finally, transfer of learning happens when students apply understanding to new context. And so this is sort of their definitions of these. And if we do surface level learning well, then students are going to be able to move to deeper levels of learning and transfer of learning more efficiently. And so here is the gift that Lynn Erickson has given to the field. And it's a simple formula. I made this sort of visual two concepts stated together in relationship equals conceptual understanding. And so here's two that are from the Alberta new curriculum. Grouping by 10 creates patterns and place value to make working with numbers efficient. Oral and body language can be adjusted to enhance communication. So what we want is we want students to not simply understand the concepts by themselves, as all of our previous examples explained. That's surface level learning. If we want to get to deep levels of learning, then we have to ask students to make connections about the relationships between concepts. That's when deeper level learning happens. And so we want to get kids to articulate something like these two bullet points down below. So we'll talk about how we get there. And what we're doing when we do that is help to build schema in their brains. And so I learned that even with my, my adult learners, I have to unpack this word just, just like we do with students. So schema is simply patterns of thought that we use to organize our world. They're simply patterns of thought that we use to organize our world. And when we connect concepts in relationship, I don't intend for you to read what's going on in this little guy's head. I just want you to sort of see as a visual what schema is, is ways in which we organize. And when we connect those concepts in relationship, that's when we're building that schema for them. And so here's 
again, a way oversimplification. This is not actually what it looks like in the brain, but just a visual to help us sort of visualize what we want to happen for kids. And so what's this is basically neurons firing in the brain. And so we can think about it like this. Kids are walking around. Most students are walking around. This is sort of like upper elementary. Maybe they've got a recycle neuron. Maybe they've got a rainforest neuron. And maybe they've got a habitat neuron. And the problem is they're not talking to each other. And what we need to do is help them to connect them. And that's where these conceptual relationships questions come into play. This is not an exhaustive list. It's simply a list that you can use to sort of play with. But we want kids to make connections between concepts. And so using these question stems is a way to help us ask kids exactly what it is we want to get out of them. So for that example that I just shared with you, we could say, what effect do human actions have on habitats? What effect do human actions have on habitats? And we could explore different things that people do to have effects on habitats. Then we're getting the neurons to talk to each other. So students, we want students to say things such as, human actions lead to consequences on habitats. And then they have to ground it in the fact-rich example. For example, when we recycle paper, less trees need to be cut down from the rainforest, protecting habitats for animals. So in a statement, you'll see in my books, I call them statements of conceptual relationships. In a statement that students are articulating, that's when they're building schema in their brain, they're making, they're connecting the dots essentially to what they're learning. And so here's a quick example of, I, we shared a several um, early years example. So I wanna to go to the other end of the spectrum. And this is, simply a uh, ninth grade social studies class from the Singapore American School. And I'm gonna do just a think aloud because I'm a social, social studies teacher. And so it's my discipline. If I see a student saying, power plus leadership mixed with greed can lead to conflict. It tells me something about what that student understands about social studies. If a student says rights mixed with beliefs, mixed with freedom equals change, it tells me a little bit, but I need to know more. And so I need them to either tell me orally or to write it out. And so here's an example. The teacher simply said, the teacher, um, there were two teachers, Doug Basie and Jason Atkinson. They said, what, put these words together in either a statement or a question. You don't have to use all of them, but they gave them perspective, power, leadership, rights, change, beliefs, and conflicts. And said, put these together. And so the student wrote, the power that comes with leadership gives the right to change society's perspective on their beliefs. And so I'm circling the word right because I'm seeing that that student is confusing the concept of authority. Governments have authority, not right. Um, and so that's something that I can think about. Maybe I wanna do a lesson plan on the difference between rights and authority. And then if I jump down, are power and leadership always connected? That's also giving me some very good food for thought. So that's a really profound thought for a ninth grader. And it's making me see that the, the class might be ready to then talk about different forms of power. For example, the, a worker's right to organize for fair pay. That's not the same thing as leadership, but it is an example of power. And so I'm, I'm seeing that the student is ready for different ideas. And so I just like to show those examples so you guys can see different um, contexts of different examples. So here's another key point, very much related to the first key point. Students must show or tell their understanding of the concepts by themselves was our first key point, but also the relationships between concepts. Again, so that we know where they are in the learning journey and they can consolidate and solidify their understanding and make essential connections to their world. And so if you guys would like, now you can select concepts you are currently teaching and ask students to show or tell how they are related. You will be so surprised. This is the big aha moment that most teachers that we work with have, is when they go straight into their classroom, that example that I just gave you was the next day after a workshop, these teachers went into the classroom and just said, hey guys, what's the, what's the relationship between all these concepts we've been talking about? And that's when the light bulb moment comes off for teachers where they say, actually kids can do this. So I'll give you just a few seconds to think about um, some concepts you're currently teaching and how you might ask students to tell us or show us how they're related.
And so we want to move away from questions that are just right or wrong questions. And we want to help kids understand that this is not the only way to learn, that it's really about the quality of our thinking. And so again, I'll put these questions of conceptual relationship up here so you guys can see these are the, this is not exhaustive, they're just samples, but these are the ways that you can sort of plug in, um, I'm seeing Ariel say as like an exit ticket or something like that, just to sort of see, can kids make these, these relationships? And so all of this is moving us towards, I used to call this the conceptual inquiry cycle, and now I'm naming it the learning transfer cycle. We want to ask kids a conceptual question and take them through specific context. And so I used to think about teaching in this very linear way, and now, taking kids through this, these different contexts, I have my question of conceptual relationship, and then I take them through different contexts to really illuminate the answers to that question. And so I'm going to have Natalie take us through an, an elementary example, and then I'll go through a middle and a high school example. Yes. So in, there's a lot of um, curriculum documents already have their big idea or the en en enduring understanding or for the PYP, if you're in the IB world, the central idea is already a statement of conceptual relationship or um, so is the MYP um, and, and many of the essential understandings of the diploma program. So the first thing is to identify the big idea or the central idea and then turn it into a question. So looking at uh, the conceptual relationship question um, tab, yeah. So you have um, to address the central idea. So you look at the central idea and come up with a conceptual uh, question. So the cent so you can address the, uh, the central idea. So the question is, how do rules impact a community? And so the goal is to deepen our understanding of why communities create rules. It's not a simple answer. So by exploring this question through multiple contexts, you always come back. So you will look at, you will look at family, then classroom, then school, and you're deepening and refining their understanding. And finally, by providing opportunities for students to improve their contextual relationship in class, you eventually bring them to a new context, to a real world transfer. So here we're looking at how rules can impact a neighborhood of skating rink. And let's see what the students came up with. For example, some students will need to come up with rules on how everyone in the community can use their rink safely. So examples were um, vary the times of skating. So maybe at a certain time, the younger students, it's younger skaters or the beginners can skate and later time, the more advanced. Or some students even came up with an example by dividing the skating rink. So the beginners can skate on one side. So as, as we were talking about, you keep going back to that context Diff using different contexts, but going back to that question, and then they can move on to a real world transfer and use what they've learned and apply it to something new. So coming back to our, our visual of surface level learning, deep learning and transfer, I hope you guys are starting to see it. And it's a very short amount of time, but in, in just 45 minutes, we're trying to show you a bunch of examples of how if we do surface level learning well, by making meaning of individual concepts, then asking kids to state the relationship between concepts. And so surface level learning is initial exploration of a concept and its critical attributes. And then we ask them, what's the relationship between these two concepts? For example, that's when they're doing deeper learning. And then when they can apply their understanding to new situations or contexts, that's when they're able to transfer it to new situations. So our key points is that students must provide evidence to support their conceptual relationship. They can't just say, you know, humans can harm the environment. They have to give us evidence. They ha we have to provide opportunities for them to improve their conceptual relationships in class. And transfer is both a means and an end. We can't wait till the end of the unit or the summative assessment or the end of the year and just hope that transfer happens because transfer helps to deepen and refine their understanding. And so the next step you could do in this, and we don't have time for you to do it now, but the next step you would do is to think of multiple contexts where students can apply the conceptual relationships to deepen and refine their understanding. 
So I'm going to show you some quick examples of what Natalie just shared for middle school and high school in different subject areas. And so we could ask science, middle school science students, what's the relationship between cycles and matter? And what happens when there is a blockage or a dysfunction at any point in a cycle? And so we could ask them that question, what's the relationship between cycles, matter, and blockages? We could start with the rock cycle, which is pretty simple, then move on to the water cycle, then move on to the carbon cycle, and then something a little bit more complex as the nitrogen cycle. And soon as we start to see the relationships between cycles, matter, and blockages, eventually helping them to understand something as complicated as the greenhouse effect, or even, this is foundational understanding for understanding climate change and how things are super interrelated and the world is one sort of big giant cycle. And here's an English example. What's the relationship between literary elements and their impact on the audience? So what I often find with English teachers or language teachers is that they don't ask kids about the relationship between different literary elements. What's the impact of new forms and mediums of communication on society? So this was a teacher in a school that I was working with, uh, high school English, that was asking about literary elements and their impact on the audience. And they looked through different, three different genres. They looked at Langston Hughes poetry and Tennessee Williams plays and then Gabriel Garcia Marquez's novels. So they were deepening and refining the relationship between literary elements and their impact on the audience. And because each of these three um, sort of authors were revolutionary and doing sort of um, new things for their times, they then transferred it to social media and its impact um, on the world and using this as a transfer task, a real world transfer task. And so I want to end with um, a couple of sort of a food for thought as you guys are thinking about long term planning. So we gave you some strategies you could use right away. This is the, uh, a visual that my co-authors and I created to help us think about the, the similar tasks. So transferring to similar tasks would be low road and transferring to dissimilar, really complicated tasks would be high road. And most of the time when people are talking about transfer, they're talking about academic transfer. We've added this other dimension to say, we can go along a spectrum, along a scale to more real world tasks, more, more tasks that have value beyond the school walls. And so Natalie's gonna talk briefly about um, doing something like this with kindergarten and grade one students. Yes, so this was part of the health unit and the conceptual understanding, the statement was meeting our physical and emotional needs helps us to make us happy. So I thought, how am I going to make this interesting for my little people, for my, my grade ones? So I in, came up with this doll, the stuffed doll that you see on the picture there that has a neutral color and was about the size of a little kindergarten kid. And we looked at the two concepts of physical and emotional needs. And so in class, we went through together as a class and adding the physical needs such as creating a gender, um, clothing it, uh, body parts, and the doll then took on an ad identity. To look at the emotional needs, the students had to take it take the little doll over home, at, at home overnight. And the next day they had to show and tell and explain to the class how they met the emotional and physical needs of their new friend after a home visit. And through the show and tell, I really could understand whether they understood the conceptual understanding. Just a side note, one student said to me, oh, it is really hard to be a parent. Um, because they found it really hard to take care of this child, mm -hmm. this little dog. <laughs> Later on, we did an action piece too in the school. So because of the physical needs, we, um, we, we uh, came up with a drive for the school and raised donated goods to a local shelter. And for the emotional needs, we came, the students and I, we all came up that they had to go outside and show kindness to a student, someone in the, in, the, in the yard that they didn't know and just show kindness and they had to come back and report it. So a simple kindergarten grade one uh, conceptual relationship, but to make it really interesting and meaningful for these children. Awesome, thank you, Natalie. So sure. we're gonna go to the other end of the spectrum of high school and looking at coming back to our original um, issues that we talked about, what are the things that 
we talked about. And so what if we ask kids, what effect do climate change and jobs have on equity? How, what effect do climate change and jobs have on equity or on health? And we could use that as a transfer test for our students. And so I want to just show you how the um, next generation science standards are organized because this is ultimately the kind of thing that we want to do. So right here, I don't expect you to read these. I just want you to see this is what they call the, the performance expectations or their learning outcomes. And, and then that's what kids are going to do. But right here, the cross-cutting concepts and the disciplinary core ideas are conceptual relationships. And I've, I've typed one up big so you can see all human activity draws on natural resources and has both short-term and long-term consequences, positive as well as negative, for the health of people and the natural environment. That's a conceptual relationship. And they've also got ties to literacy and to mathematics down at the bottom. And so this is a great way, a great place to start if you're thinking about interdisciplinary work. But this is essentially about engineering. And so I don't know if you guys have seen this, but this is a story on Mashable about an all-girl engineer team that designed a tent, a solar-powered tent for the homeless. And so these are, are teenagers living in San Fernando Valley of Los Angeles, where the homelessness population um, has exploded since they were freshmen, they're seniors, and they wanted juniors and seniors, they wanted to do something about it. And so this is the type of project that become, can become scalable for all of our kids if learning transfer becomes the intentional focus. And so it's something that won't be just this one-off project that we see, wow, how awesome these kids. But if we organize curriculum in this way, then kids, I want you to think about this visual with the concentric circles. So if we ask kids an abstract conceptual question, such as what effect do climate change and jobs have on equity? We could start with something in the classroom that everybody studies together. And then the next context and even the next context, the students can study whatever they want to study as long as it's building that relationship between two or more concepts and they're building schema in their brain. And so that, to me, makes us feel like I use this visual to teach kids that extreme freedom is not liberty, that extreme freedom is anarchy, that no rules is anarchy. And so we don't, we want to have what we're trying to do in democracies is create some sort of ordered liberty where there's freedom within structure and within order. And what we're seeing is that if we can organize curriculum in this way, then we're the closest thing we can get to ordered liberty. If we're marching kids through standards that have no impact in their lives, that feels like tyranny. But if we're throwing everything out, throwing all the curriculum out and just letting them do whatever they want, that feels like anarchy. But I feel like if we organize our curriculum in this way, we're getting at um, ordered liberty in a better way. And so that's all we have for you guys. We're ready to take, I think we have time for a couple questions before we end the webinar, but we wanna thank you guys so much for coming. Yeah, hi, Julie. Hi, Natalie. I have a couple of questions that came in. Uh, let's see here. Could you give an example of a concept at the surface level that came through a couple of times? People are interested in that. So all concepts are, are essentially surface level. It's, it's the exposure to the, to the concept. So it's initial exploration of whatever the concept is. And so if you're exploring, um, you know, a teacher put up their persuasive writing, if you're exploring per persuasive writing, um, that could be in and of itself a concept. And the idea is to sort of distinguish persuasive writing from exploratory or explanatory writing. Um, and so it, de it super depends on what your discipline is. So I can't really just sort of rattle off, but think of surface level learning as initial exploration of a single concept. Thank you. Here's another question. We have different level of learners in our classes. How can we incorporate three levels of learning in, a, in such a class where we have diverse learners? That's a great question. And if you switch to this type of teaching and learning, if you move in this direction, you can really um, reach all students. A really quick example I want to give is I work with um, a school, a middle school in, in somewhat rural Georgia. And so these are kids that, um, they, they have big old trucks and they like to take the trucks in the mud to go mud riding. And I'm from Louisiana, so I, I can relate. Um, but this, the science teacher wanted to explain the relationship between structure and function. And so she thought of this idea to say, why wouldn't we take a Prius mud riding 
because she knew she could reach those particular students and what they were interested in. And so when you, when you think about concepts as, as, when you're thinking about the examples of the concepts or Natalie bringing in her bicycle to, to illustrate system, you can think about what is something that is interesting to these kids and how can you relate that to the concept? How can you use that as one of the examples that you're exploring to, to see the critical attributes of a concept? Thank you. Last question. What would be a suggestion from you if we wanted to start this in preschool to support the foundations in kindergarten with this conceptual understanding? Or is that too early an age to start? Definitely not too early. I think that, um, and Natalie, jump in if you want to say anything, but yeah. I think it's for those guys, it's getting them to show and tell their understanding in, in a way that's, you know, not um, overly you know, academic, um, but getting them to show us and tell us what they understand about different concepts is, is the best place to start. Yeah, often little, uh, the young children will talk at a very simple level, a very easy example, but they will talk at, at, at like a concept. They'll say plant, well, let's look at plants, and then you build around that with the students. It's actually very easy to do that in the preschool if you look at the concept at the age appropriateness, and it works. Terrific, thank you. I, uh, that brings us to the end of the questions and we can turn it back over to uh, Charlene. Okay, great, thank you so much, Jeff. And thank you so much, Julie and Natalie for your presentation today. I'd also like to thank everybody who participated in our poll questions and uh, submitted chat comments and questions. Um, if you didn't have a chance to get your question answered today, we will send them to Julie and Natalie after the webinar and they will share their responses with you. Um, Julie also shared page references from uh, uh, to several resources in her books that can help you put the ideas and strategies mentioned today into action. And you can also find additional tools and examples, lesson examples from all different uh, grade levels and, um, and content areas in her book. Um, as a thank you for attending this webinar, we are offering a 20% discount on her books with promo code webinars19 right there and when you order through Corwin. You can, if you want to learn more about learning transfer, you can catch uh, Julie and Natalie, along with other certified uh, consultants. They will be presenting on this topic at the 2019 Annual Visible Learning Conference in Las Vegas this July. You can see their session topics on the screen here. To learn more about this event and to register, you can visit corin.com slash AVL 2019. And then if you are looking to go deeper into this work and help transfer these strategies to your school or district, Corin offers a series of face-to-face -face workshops and implementation support uh, through our team of certified consultants, uh, which includes um, both Julie and Natalie. And you can visit corin.com slash transfer to learn more about our available consulting services, or you can talk to your Corin PD advisor about your professional learning needs and goals. And finally, if you enjoyed today's webinar, we invite you to come back in two weeks for our next webinar on instructional coaching with uh, best-selling author Jim Knight. Our full spring lineup is here on the screen for you. You can sign up for these free webinars at www.corin.com slash webinars. And then finally, on behalf of Julie Stern, Natalie Lorio, and the entire Corin team, I'd like to thank you for joining us today. And I w uh, wish you a good evening. Thank you for coming. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.